Thank you for choosing to watch our video. We're happy to provide these from our gospel meeting with David Hurst from Somerset, Kentucky on October the 9th through the 14th, 2022. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications of new content. Leave us a comment and watch the other videos from this gospel effort. And now, on to the sermon. Again, we want to add our comments that we're so appreciative of everyone being here this evening. And most especially for me this week, uh, even though we were here just a few short years, we made very close, as Christians always do, very close friends and loved ones and family members. And as has been pointed out, we'll see each other in heaven as we each live as we should. And what a joy that is to look forward to. And tonight's lesson really deals with that a lot. If you'll open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. We'll be looking there first tonight as we look at this particular text. There's no doubt that the gospel is God's power unto salvation. No doubt in this. But in that, there's a kernel of redemptive Christianity that gives power to the overall thing. And that's what we're going to discuss tonight. I think part of the problem that sometimes we face as Christians, and, and we're really coming to the end of this meeting as we talk about these types of things that cause us never to give up, we're going to see tonight that this thing that we're talking about is talked about here. Look at Luke 24, and we'll see here that there are two disciples on the road to, to Emmaus. Uh, if you look down in verse 13, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. Not very far. That'd be about seven miles. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. By the way, I should set the setting on this, and that is that Jesus had died. Everybody's talking about the fact and all the events surrounding that. And that's the discussion. That's what's going on. That's the situation. As these two are talking together of all these things which had happened. Verse 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Remember, he'd been killed. He'd been buried. It'd been three days. He shows up. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these things that you have one to another as you walk and are sad, or some versions say are looking sad. And notice that their countenance has dropped. They're looking sad. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass these days? And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God, and all the people. I mean, this, this was some kind of person. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted, or you and I might say, we were hoping that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came and said they had seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, this is the events that now take place. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, 
he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And as they drew nigh unto the village, remember they're walking about seven score furlongs, somewhere in that range. As they approached, they constrained him in verse 29, saying, Abide with us, for it's toward the evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as they sat at the meat with them, as they took bread, he blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. This happened. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said, Did not our hearts burn within us when he opened to us the scriptures? I tell you, when you, when you read that, you look at verse 13, they're talking, they're walking, they're dejected, they're looking sad in verse 17 and in verse 21, but we were hoping. Our dream was, you, you can feel how they, they had hoped. This was what it was all about. And then Christ in, opens their eyes of understanding as you see there in verse 32. These are not the same disciples you find in Luke 19 and verse 38. In that as Jesus approaches the city of Jerusalem, everybody's praising God and hallelujah and praise to Hosanna. And they're pulling down palm branches. They're, laying, they're pulling off their coats and they're laying down. They're joyful and they're happy. He's coming into town and everybody's excited. They're filling and swelling the air with praise. But now he's buried. Now he's crucified. And these two disciples, once on fire with zeal and excitement for a day of the Lord, they now, don't you know? Don't you understand? Are you just a stranger that you don't get it? There's a difference there when you look at this. As you think about those two fellows, and we just read that in its entirety, the, the event that took place there, what's the difference? They really hadn't lost their faith. They talked about all the mighty deeds that he did, how great he was in, in what he spoke, and among all the people, they hadn't lost their faith particularly. And they hadn't lost their life for him. They were hoping that he was the one that would redeem Israel. They hadn't lost that either. But the one thing they had lost, by the way, their concept of him redeeming Israel was in a materialistic kingdom concept, but, but still, they were hoping. But that one thing that they had lost, that was that burning zeal that we, read, that, that we can read about Luke 19, 37, verse 38, where these men are so joyful as they're talking here. They'd lost that burning fire. But when Jesus spoke to them about the redemptive nature of his mission and the cross and the results of it in that Old Testament prophecies, again did their hearts begin to burn. I'd like to suggest tonight, as you consider each of us, as we consider ourselves as we think about Christians across the world that maybe the church of our Lord sometimes seems like it's not far maybe what seven furlongs seven seven miles I should say not not very far from maybe where it ought to be we still have our faith that's right we're, we're still willing to make some sacrifices for it and we still have our love, as we think about it, with, at least to some degree, we're willing to do those things for him. But the one thing that seems as a whole in many churches is this burning zeal or fervor that causes you to drop things, to get out and to do things and to talk to your friends and to talk to your neighbors. And you, you, you look at it and you wonder, why I mean, yeah, you, you expect the preacher to he's getting paid for it, right? 
You expect somebody else to do it. But, but what about me? And we begin to think about that. We see very few people really thinking realistically we need to get some, some home studies going. We need to study with each other. We need to study with others that we can find. And we begin to think about this idea and we begin to think about the fact that sometimes we see people and on Wednesday nights when their local church may be meeting, they're, they're out in the mall, they're home watching TV or they're doing something else. And you begin to think about those things and what you're beginning to see is that, that yeah, people have some faith and they have some love, but they just don't have that, that burning desire and force that no people or no power can stop them. No matter what the persecution, no matter what the suffering. And so we see the early church here with the idea of the resurrection. That's what happened. Don't forget it. Here is the resurrection. The fact that made them to go into all the world. Remember what we talked about a few nights ago and as you took uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20 and Luke, as Luke said that Jesus had to come, suffer, be crucified, that remission, uh, repentance and forgiveness of sins might be preached. What's happened to us? You know, sometimes, uh, you all call them fire plugs here? You know what I mean by fire plug? Fire hydrant? Fire plug? Okay, good. A fire plug. You know what? Nobody really likes them. If, you, if, if there's one by your house, you have to mow around it. It's ugly. You can't paint it because they want a certain color. And they'll, they'll go over and paint it again. Or they're digging a ditch in your yard to find out why it's stopped up. You can't plant any flowers around it because they'll come and they'll spray it. And all the flowers, get, nobody really likes a fire plug unless you have an emergency. Now, if you've got an emergency, it's a good thing to have. Everybody wants it then because that'll, that'll save lives. That'll save your house. And sometimes Christianity, for some people, is like an emergency religion. Nobody really wants it. We don't be really devoted to it unless there's a time for it, a need for it. And when we have a need for it, then it's a good thing to have. And we really like it then. And when we start treating Christianity and following God as an emergency religion, what we have is we have some people that, that may have some faith and they may have some love, but they don't have that burning zeal to go out and talk to somebody else about Jesus Christ. What we need to do tonight as we look at this, I want to focus on this resurrection. I want us to look and see and, and, and let's study together in the scriptures how this resurrection fit into the picture in New Testament times. Jesus appeared to the apostles. He came back from the dead, never to go again, and he appeared to them, and when he did, it gave them power. It gave overall power and scope to the message that they were teaching. And it's the idea of witnessing that we read about in the Bible. When you look at New Testament witnessing, and it's not like that witnessing that you hear about sometimes today. Sometimes you hear about people that are Jehovah's Witnesses or witnessing for Jehovah, and in this sense, in the sense that we're talking about, John 1, 18, no one's ever seen God and lived. You couldn't be a witness for God in that sense. It'd be like a fellow going to the courtroom and, and the judge says to him, I want you to give your testimony. I know you weren't here and you didn't see anything, but tell us what happened. He clears his throat. <clears throat> yeah, I wasn't there and I didn't see anything, but let me tell you what happened. And people who try and give testimony, witnessing for Jehovah in that sense, it doesn't, doesn't work. It, it's false. Another concept is, is to give witnessing about how you feel. And that's what a lot of denominations do. They say, let me give you my testimony. Let me, let me witness to you about how I feel. And they start talking about what all they feel about. Some, some fellow said, I was, in, I was in the shower last night, and I was ready to cut my wrist. I was ready to end it all. And all of a sudden, I saw a light over the shower cutting, and, and I'm here to give you my testimony. And I feel great about it now. You know, lights over a shower curtain... Don't tell you anything about Christianity. 
Lights over a shower curtain don't motivate you in any way to be what you ought to be. Here, look at John 15. Here is the Bible teaching about witnessing. This is what we're going to study here tonight as we look at it together. It's shown threefold. First, who are God's witnesses? Number one, John 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter, speaking of the Holy Spirit, when the Comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So one witness is going to be the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that's going to be sent back to testify. In verse 27, And ye also, witnesses, now mark it, who are these? And ye also shall bear witness, mark it, because ye have been with me from the beginning. In Acts chapter 10, Peter's going to go preach, and he's, he's going to speak to this man, Cornelius. We all know the story, beginning there in verse 39. Remember, these men had been with Jesus from the beginning. Now, in verse 39, And we are witnesses, Peter says, we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, now listen, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now who are the witnesses? Can anybody be a witness? Peter says, no, not to all the witnesses, but only to those, again, those from the beginning, who did eat and drink with him. What were they witnesses of? What they felt? That some light happened and that they saw on the way? No. The fact that Jesus did mighty wonders. They saw them. They knew who he was. The fact that whenever he came out of the tomb, he was the same Jesus that they knew. He arose from the third day and they saw it. And that's what the, they gave testimony to. And that gave power to everything that was preached. When they preached Jesus and the resurrection, the Messiah resurrected. These were things that they taught. Not how they felt. What they saw. What they experienced. And in Acts 13, this is, helps me so much when I look at what Paul said. Paul was an apostle. But Paul wasn't like them. And so here in Acts chapter 13, down in verse 29, Paul says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree. This is, this is Jesus, been killed, take him down from the tree, laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee. Who are the witnesses? At this point, Paul says, I'm not one of them. Not that he wasn't a witness, not that he wasn't one of the apostles. Absolutely he was, ever much as the rest of them. But here he excludes himself because he was not one of those that came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. Paul was a witness to something else. But these men were a witness to the fact that they had seen Jesus when he was living before his death, what he was like, what he taught, what he did, saw him die, and then whenever he came from the dead. They were with Christ from the beginning. By the way, remember in Acts chapter 1, when the angel spoke to those, he said, ye men of Galilee. These men were called the Galileans because they were with him from that point. I want to talk to you real quick about Thomas. We all know the story. We, we mentioned him earlier this, uh, in this series of lessons and didn't talk about him much, and we're not going to talk about him a lot tonight. I did want to point out to you, though, that a lot of people just look at him and they say, there's a doubting Thomas, and, and I think we give him such a bad rap sometimes about that. But Thomas was one of those ones that was chosen. He had given up his life, like the other apostles, to follow Jesus and to go along with, and, and wherever he went. And he was dedicated. Jesus chose certain ones. Thomas was one of them. In John 11, whenever... Jesus, this is toward the end of his ministry, and he's going to go to Jerusalem. 
and they know he's got a death sentence on his head and, and he's going to go there and he's going to die. But he, they try and keep him from going. He says, but I'm going to go. And it's Thomas who speaks to him and says, all right, he's going, let's go. We'll all die with him. That's who Thomas was. So after the resurrection, that first Sunday, Thomas, we don't know why. We, this not even to my point tonight, but he wasn't there. The other men, they were there. Of course, Judas is not. The other men are there. They see Jesus. Jesus leaves, and they tell Thomas. What's Thomas think? Thomas knows what he's seen. Thomas knows what's happened to Jesus. Thomas knows that he was buried. And Thomas says, I'm not a fool. I'm nobody's fool, and I, I know what I saw. Now, now maybe I don't know what caused him, but but maybe he he thinks that they're hope like these two on the road to Emmaus. Maybe they're, they're they, they they think they see. But Thomas says, unless I, unless I'm able to see him in his body, and see where they pierced his side, see where they put those nails, unless I see that person, I won't believe unless I see that person, Thomas says. A week later, Thomas is with him. And evidently somebody's been reading somebody's heart because when Jesus walks in with the locked door and he says, here Thomas, put your fingers over here where they nailed this flesh. Take a look here where they pierced this side. Thomas said, my Lord, my God. A witness. He knew what he was seeing then. That's how it affected him. You know, when you start looking at this, that's why Luke chapter 24, as we uh, paraphrased a moment ago, when they went preaching about that he came to suffer and to rise again the third day, that repentance and forgiveness of sins might be preached. With this witnessing, what did they do? They went everywhere preaching that message. The purpose of witnessing, as we read about it in the Bible, was number one, there were two reasons. Number one, it was a proof, a guarantee. John 20, 30 and 31, John says many other things. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples are not written in his book. But when you think of all the things Jesus did, on top of it, Jesus coming from the dead, never to go back again. These things are written that you might believe and that believing you might have life in his name. Jesus himself said, uh, chapter 11, verse 25, he says, I am the life. Even if you're dead, he that believeth in me shall live. That's what we're talking about here. It really comes to light. In 1 Corinthians 15, you want to flip over to that. There are some people saying there's not going to be any resurrection. Some people today say that too. And, and Paul's discussing with them, you know, it, it makes no sense to say there's not going to be a resurrection. It makes no sense for, for someone to take this gospel that is empowered by the fact that Jesus came out of the grave. It makes no sense to preach that gospel and say there's no resurrection. And so he says here in verse 12, he says, now Christ is preached. And if there is no resurrection, then he gives us four consequences in verses 14, 15, and 19. He says, if Christ is not, if there's no resurrection, he says, then you've got preaching that's lies. You've got vain preaching. If there's no resurrection, you've got people believing something that there's no reason to believe. So you've got vain faith. And then they're liars, these witnesses, because if he didn't resurrect and there's no resurrection, then you've got vain witnesses. And then he says in verse 19, he says, if, if all this is so, then we got no hope. And so you've got vain hope. The consequences of not believing in the resurrection, just astounding how it destroys everything. You know what happened 
in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, when Christians, when they started teaching, they started preaching, Satan wanted to destroy them, wanted to get rid of them, so he persecuted them, and they went everywhere, and they all hid behind their doors and locked them, right? Is that what it said? They went everywhere, preaching and teaching. I'm going to come back to them. I'm just going to ask you, what caused them to do that? And whenever you look at Paul and what he preached, as I said, he was an apostle, not any whit behind the others. Uh, God had a special purpose for him. Paul goes and he starts preaching. Go to Acts 17. And I want you to notice what Paul says as he begins to preach and what, what he's determining here. He says, and the times of this ignorance, the time in which men you know, are just unaccountable in their own mind that they don't know what's going on, they don't care, they don't know. Paul says, the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. By the way, that was the message that Luke 24 said would be that message. Everyone and everywhere has got to repent. I can just hear someone. I can just see someone as he's sitting there and he's starting to get a little grin on his face. He says, why, Paul? I don't want to repent. I don't want to repent. Why have I got to repent? Paul continues there in this text. Because he hath chosen or appointed a day in which he'll judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained. Big deal. I could just see or hear someone saying that in my mind. Big deal. How do I know? Give me some proof. Paul continues there in verse 31. Where have, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. You think Paul would change the message of the gospel for a bunch of intellectuals at Athens? He didn't. He preached that same gospel. He preached it before the governor officials. He preached it all the way to the seat of Nero. And he didn't change one word of it. He preached that you had to repent and be obedient because Jesus came out of that too. I've got to look at this and notice that the proof that Paul furnished there is the proof that they'd had since those two walked on the road to Emmaus. And that is that that tomb wasn't empty. Most preachers have lots of books, and a lot of them they have, and it happens that sometimes you pick up books that people, they don't believe in God, and you read them to see why they don't believe in God or why they're, they're so... Uh, atheistic in their thinking and so forth. Some of the most obnoxious writings you can read and they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They, they don't believe that, that He can, They don't believe any of that. But every one of them I've ever seen all admit to one thing that they will not change and they have to admit it. And that is on that third day that when that stone was rolled back and you looked in there, that tomb was empty. There was no body in there. I mean, no physical body was in there. And in that part of the world, everybody knew that. It was common knowledge. The body wasn't there. Because any gospel built on a blatant lie where someone really didn't resurrect you just go and say, here's the body. He was there. He is there. Come look. Come see. They bring it in the street even. But everybody's got to admit one thing. That body wasn't there. Well, what happened to it? You could say, somebody stole it. Well, how'd they do that? After all, they had a rotation, four men, four times in the night, rotated. That way, even if one of the four fell asleep, the other three are awake, or whatever you want to say, and then they were, it's just a four-hour shift, not, not a problem. And, and their life is in jeopardy if they don't. So, no, it makes no sense that they could have messed up. They didn't mess up. Nobody, nobody got through them. Well, the, the Sanhedrin doesn't want the body. 
They didn't want, that's why they wanted the soldiers there. They want to make sure the body stays there. Soldiers can't take it. The disciples had no ability to fight off the soldiers and take it, and that didn't happen. So what happened to the body? When you look at what it says here, the evidence of an empty tomb, that's what gave power to the gospel in New Testament times. Back to Acts 8. These people that are being persecuted and hounded, and as they go to their different places upon persecution, they can't help but speak what they know. And that is, we're talking about a resurrected Lord. We know that He resurrected. We know He's coming again. We know this because these are the evidences. They put what they thought was the son of a carpenter in that tomb, and out on the third day came a God, and we know He's God. And if he's God, I'll listen to him. And if he's God, you'll listen to him. And people sometimes are just not rational when we start thinking about that New Testament time with those events. Sometimes people look at the paper. Someone's died. Maybe they'll put a quote in there about something that they said or something that they've done. And, and they'll do that sometimes. Sometimes it's usually someone notable of notoriety. But we look here... I can tell you a story about someone who was dead for three days, unquestionably. And he came back. And we can read what he said, without a doubt. If you will look at 1 John chapter 1, as you go to that, let me say, you know what the problem is sometimes? that We know the stories. We know the truths. We, we've studied it. But, but the impact of it. Those two on the road to Emmaus. They were sad. They were. So. Disappointed. They had wanted. As I said in a materialistic concept. But they would wanted to see this Messiah. The King of Israel. They knew he could do great things. But something changed in their hearts. In 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we've handled our own hands, speaking of Jesus, these fellows are saying, we didn't make it up. The evidence doesn't support a made-up story. We were with him from the beginning. We know what he looked like. We know what he sounded like. We know who he was. And we saw him. I know he came from the dead because I sat down and I ate with him. I know he came from the dead. I heard him. I know his voice. He talked. Thomas says, I know he can. I could see the nail prints. I know who he is. He's alive. That's the gospel that went out and was preached. In New Testament times. And people heard the evidences of that. Sometimes in my life, I look at things. And I think about things. Oftentimes, as a boy, it really fascinated me that, that Peter somehow had a sword. That whenever Jesus was in the garden, and remember that night, when Jesus was preparing those men in chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 of John, and he was talking to them about what was going to have to happen, and he says, you'll all forsake me. No, we won't. Of course, we all feel that way, of course, in many times, many ways, but said no. And Peter, with the courage that he had, and said, even if I would die with you, just like Thomas had said back over there at the house of Lazarus, if we should die with you, he grabs that sword and he whacks at the head of that fella, cuts off an ear. Jesus sticks it back on. Can you imagine what it must have been like there? And then Peter, they all fled. Peter falls afar off. Peter's warming himself there, let me say by the devil's fire as they're trying to hurt our Lord, destroy him. And someone sees his countenance there and says, hey, that's, that's one of them. He says, nope, nope, not me. 
You remember what he did? At the last one, before the cock crowed twice, he swore, I don't know him. I've never known him. I don't know him. And that time Jesus turned and looked at him. Oh, boy. I wonder if anybody's going to get that look when we face God on the judgment. Because the way we live our lives, we live like we don't know him, never do him, don't live for him, don't care about him. But Peter just went out and wept bitterly. But that's not the end. Don't know what was said. I've always imagined it. and have no idea, but I, always in my imagined heart, I, I could see just a, just a heart-breaking thing when Jesus appeared to, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared to Peter. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are there. There's this fellow by the gate. He's wanting alms, and they said, we, we don't have that. What we got, we'll give you. And a miracle's performed. The man gets up, causes a great stir in everybody. We talked about this a couple lessons ago. They were warned, don't preach. He says, whether it be right, to hark unto ye more than the God judge ye. We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. This is the same Peter. These are the same men. And now there's something that's stirring in them, giving them, like those two on the road to a mass, understanding the gospel plan of redemption and salvation. And they're seeing this, as we said last night, something causes them to want to share so that others have the same hope. And then, as we talked about a couple of nights ago, when they're out there and they're preaching again, and they're questioned, and this, this, this time, we, we know James was killed in Acts 12. This time, just like they killed Jesus, you, you figure you're, you're going to be a dead man. They said, we gave you strict orders not to preach anymore in his name. Behold, you filled all of Jerusalem with his teaching, with his name. What's, what's the deal here? And they just shortened it. We must obey God rather than men. Have you ever wondered why we just don't have the courage sometimes? Or we, we don't have the concern? Or I don't know what we would say it is, but... And Jesus is in heaven and he's looking and he's wondering, do we really believe in the resurrection? Do we really believe it happened? And if it did... Maybe we've been seven miles from where we ought to be, looking sad and being discouraged. And what we need to do is to have that same gospel message stir in our hearts, wake us up to the fact that, yeah, he's coming again. And other people need to hear this message too. And we need to be busy preaching what Jesus did in New Testament times when he came out of that tomb and showed himself alive. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As he said in Mark, and he tells them, He that believeth and is baptized shall be damned. He that believeth not, you know, if you don't believe. He that, I think I said that back. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If you don't believe, you're... you're what are you going to do? Of course, we believe. We're busy preaching and teaching. We're dedicated. We're giving our life. We're like these men in Acts 2. Nobody's, Acts 3, nobody's going to tell us what to preach because we know what we ought to preach. Luke 24, that Jesus came. He had to suffer. He had to rise from the dead the third day. This is what was told those two men on the road to Mass. He explained from the Old Testament Scriptures how that he would need to accomplish this so men could be saved. That's what we have. Salvation. Acts 8 and verse 4. Persecution. Boldness. Thessalonians. We told you last, maybe two nights ago. 
Thessalonians. Paul goes in there. They're pagan Isaac in their beliefs. Some of them are Jewish in their beliefs. He goes in there. They, they deny it all. That is, their past beliefs. They accept with full heart this doctrine about a resurrected Savior. And they live with boldness. Stephen. You ever wonder what makes a man preach with such boldness in the face of a mob? that's gnashing at him with their teeth, with stones ready to take his life from him, and he continues on? Paul, the fool for Christ that we talked about Wednesday evening. Folks, sometimes I think we're on the road to a mess. We're still with some faith. We're still with some love. But the burning zeal that a resurrected Savior causes has escaped us. And all we need to do is get it back. Look at the redemptive nature of what Jesus did. The signs of his miracles. The biggest, the sign of Jonah when he comes out. Never to go back to the tomb again. And Paul said, over 500 witnesses at one time sewing. You might fool a few people, but 500 of them all at one time? Folks, the resurrection's real. It's enough to motivate us. If you've never obeyed the gospel, maybe you've never had the opportunity to hear it preached, but it's, it's the greatest, most fantastic and wonderful message that you will ever hear. You can have your sins forgiven. Because Jesus, when he came out of that tomb, he conquered death. He destroyed the power of Satan over us in spiritual death and gave us hope of an eternal life with him. And that's a message worth living for, a message worth dying for. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Be thou faithful. When he says unto death, he doesn't mean to your old age. It would include it, but... He says, even they cost you your life, like it did so many New Testament Christians. Folks, that's the burning zeal those men got back on the road to Emmaus. And may we also have it in our lives. If you're here tonight and you need to make changes in your life, there's some way the church here can help you. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?